will talk about the field uh, which kind of always fascinated me, which is behavioral finance and some of the Um So I will start with showing you some paintings, and I want you to tell me what do you see here. Mouse. What? Fox? Mouse. Great. Mouse. What else? Elephant. Elephant. Very good. And what? how about this? Robot. 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 Very interesting. Any other answers? Two creatures, very good. How about this? Nemo. <laughs> very good, very interesting answers. None of these are what the, uh, I think, painters intended to do. So those are all the paintings from my fa uh, my friend's three-year-old. Uh, three year old. And at the party, my friend actually was complaining um, she splurged all the money on the kids' art lessons, but then she cannot tell uh, what the kids is doing. And uh, then I asked all the kids in the party, actually all of them know what's in the picture. Um, and that's kind of what I think about behavioral investors. So if you think about the kids, it's not that kids are drawing random things, uh, they're just drawing um, some clear perception of the world is just different from us adults. And that's how I think about behavioral investors. Behavioral investors are not behaving randomly. Uh, it's just uh, there are systematic patterns in the behaviors which are different from a uh, rational framework. Um, so to capture the systematic framework um, from 1990s, a lot of the efforts uh, have been made to incorporate a lot of uh, assumptions which are more psychologically realistic into um, the decision-making process. Um, so if you think about a uh, rational individual uh, who try to select a lifetime strategies uh, out of a um, really large opportunity set and to maximize the expected utility, uh, and then there are three dim dimensions we can kind of make the assumptions more psychologically realistic. So the first dimension is preference. Um, the traditional way is to assume uh, the utility depends on lifetime consumption. They assume uh, everyone is purely self-interested. However, the non-traditional way thinks about reference-dependent preferences, thinks about social preference. The second one is uh, belief formation. So the traditional way thinks about people do vision updating. However, non-traditional way considers over-extrapolation or overconfidence. Um, and I think the first product I think Jeanette mentioned actually related to over-extrapolation. Um, the third dimension is um, decision making. So traditional way thinks think is about uh, people can solve the complex maximization problem. However, non-traditional way uh, kind of considers all kind of cognitive limits. So to make or through making all these assumptions more psychologically realistic, what we are trying to do is to uh, find the systematic patterns how individuals think and act, and then eventually you try to better understand investors' financial decision making and also asset price implications. So what I'm going to do, I will talk about two examples uh, of systematic patterns I kind of studied uh, in some of my recent papers. So the first one related to belief formation. So through um, FinTech app, we kind of collected a lot of uh, data about investors' expectation on a, a large set of stocks. Uh, and you can sort their expectations um, into different buckets. And then you can find the uh, beliefs, their expectations actually negatively predict future returns. Uh, so that means what they think will go high in the future actually will go down, and what they think will go down in the future actually will go up. Um, so if you look at the gap, it's very sizable. So I guess like this is not very surprising. Uh, individual investors, they, uh, their beliefs are wrong, but then you can see they're wrong in a very spec uh, spectacular way. Because if you just do the opposite of what they do, you can actually make money. So I call this, they are accurately wrong. So why is that? It has to do with, or at least uh, the explanation we provide is, there is a systematic pattern in their expectation. So if you regress the expectation on the past returns, you can find um, all the weights, they are positive. So that means they extrapolate from past returns. And also they put higher weights on more recent returns. That means there is a recency effect. And it turns out this recency effect is critical for us to understand the negative return predictability. Um, so 
from the extrapolation, um, if there is a positive shock, um, then when people extrapolate, the, uh, the initial price will overshoot. But then when there is a recency uh, effect, people feel less and less excited uh, about the initial shock over time, and then the price will start to revert. So that's why the expectation negatively predict future returns. So I think this is kind of interesting by understanding the systematic patterns uh, in their expectation can help us think about return predictability. And now this kind of opens door for you to see a lot of other contexts uh, investors believe can be accurately wrong. So uh, that's the first example. The second example I want to talk about relates to the rise of a new breed of retail investors. Uh, we probably all notice during pandemic, there is a huge increase in uh, the Robinhood accounts. Uh, the number of accounts actually surpassed a lot of major brokerage firms. And now Evo is that actually Evo has a really nice paper talking about the wisdom of these investors. Uh, and if I understand it correctly, we're talking about they actually earn positive returns in terms of uh, their holdings or their positions. Uh, however, if we look at the trading behavior, uh, it's a very different picture. So thinking about some of the crazy events you see in 2020, like Hertz and Kodak here, um, and with a big influx of Robinhood investors, the price actually went up 600% or 800% for these two firms before it for, uh, fell down. Um, and not to mention uh, the infamous GameStop frenzy the next year and also a lot of crazy events with the meme stocks. Um, and this is not real events, it actually happened very frequently and very systematically. So if we use the Robinhood user change ratio as a cutoff to define the hurting events and look at the cumulative of normal return post events, you can see when the net buying of Robinhood investors um, doubles, triples, or quadruples, um, the cumulative of normal return just become larger and larger. Uh, so from left to right, this becomes more and more extreme. And for the very extreme events, uh, actually the 20-day cumulative of normal return can reach to negative 20%. Just to put this into perspective, if you look at the literature, um, the events with comparable frequency uh, only have the return in the orange range. Uh, so the return effect of this type of hurting events by Robinhood investors are enormous compared to what documented in the literature. So how to explain that? Uh, there are different, I think, uh, possible explanations. One is clientele. You can think about Robinhood investors. They're young, uh, they are probably naive, and they are first time uh, investors. So probably they just um, think and act the same and we find this highly concentrated uh, trading. Um, and you can think about social media. They are very active on social media. <coughs> Uh, and it's, I think it can be a very important mechanism to coordinate the trading. So we didn't really look at its directions. Uh, I know some of you are actually working on that, so I look forward to hearing more uh, in the afternoon. Um, what we really delve into is another mechanism, which is the coordinated attention by simplistic app design. So it's a little bit more subtle, but I, uh, I kind of like the subtlety here. So if you ever use Robinhood, uh, look at their design. It's very slim, and you could compare this with uh, the traditional brokerage app. Um, you probably feel information overloaded looking at the TD Ameritrade. Um, but then if you look at Robinhood's uh, app design, it's very simple and clear. You just get a bare minimum. So the fun twist here is that um, when you just look at a few things, these few things become really salient. Um, and for all the investors, when they look at the same few things, uh, their attention get coordinated, and that will create um, the intense buying from the investors, and then it creates the intense buying, uh, the, the pricing pressure followed by extreme negative uh, returns. And what we did in the paper is kind of um, to provide some evidence uh, showing the app design indeed matter for investors' behavior. So we kind of exploit some unique feature of the top mover list. So if you look at Robinhood versus traditional platform, traditional pr platforms separate the top gainers from the top losers. But Robinhood kind of mix them together. So instead of seeing the, um, the top gainers actually attract more net buying than top losers, 
uh, for Robin Hood, you see these two lines just overlap with each other. And another analysis we uh, explored is the top mover list. Uh, they only cover the stocks with market cap over $300 million. And indeed, you can see there is a discontinuous increase of uh, investors net buying around the cutoff. So that's just some uh, case of evidence showing that the app design indeed affect investors' uh, attention and behavior. And I think it's kind of interesting to see when their attention get coordinated, um, this type of attention induced trading can actually have unprecedented return effects. Uh, and this kind of also tells us simplicity, uh, even though it may enhance investors' welfare uh, sometimes, but it is not problem free. Uh, so I will just wrap up here, and I hope you find the, uh, the type of systematic patterns in investors' behavior as fascinating as I do. And I want to end it with uh, these three paintings. So now you see the crab, <coughs> lion, and zebra in these paintings. <laughs>